Okay, so I have a, a short presentation, um, but before that, uh, I just wanted to say that I really love this session to be uh, kind of less about me, um, like telling you stuff and more about uh, having discussions and having like real a real exchange of ideas around uh, learning and like maybe asking each other questions and seeing if we can uh, kind of if we can all learn from each other uh, because I don't feel like I'm an expert in this at all um, and uh, I'm very passionate about it I have lots of ideas um, but I learn so much from others all the time so I'd really love this to be uh, kind of more in exchange um, if you want to, uh, if you don't want to appear, that's fine. Um, I would love to see everybody's face, but of course you do you. Uh, if you don't want to speak, you can also just put um, whatever you want to say in the chat and I'll try and keep my eye on it. Um, I think it would be fun to, because there aren't that many people, I think it would be great to just go around quickly and everybody say, uh, who you are and uh, why you're here, what you're hoping to get out of it, what your experience with learning is. Um, and yeah, so I'll go first. Um, I'm Fran. I am, uh, I'm Italian. I grew up, I uh, was born, grew up in Italy. Um, I've, we travel a lot now. I have two young children. They are almost nine and 11. We've been unschooling. We kind of started off unschooling, then they were in school for a little bit. And then we've been unschooling again uh, for the past three years now. Um, what else? I am also an ex uh, Montessori guide. So I worked in preschools uh, for a bunch of time before I took the kids out of school. And uh, I write a lot about unschooling, uh, self-directed ed education, learning, education in general. Um, I also have a, a podcast, which is all about consent and consent-based education. That's kind of newish and I'm really into it. And, uh, oh, and I'm doing a master's in early childhood education at the moment. So like learning and education are something I'm really, really interested in right now. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to pass the, the mic to whoever wants to go next. If you don't want to introduce yourself, that's totally fine. You don't have to, or you can just do it in the chat. Who would like to go first? I'll go ahead and jump in. This is Kristen Morrison. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm in Germany right now, but I'm American. Um, I live in Virginia. I'm a professor of teacher education, but I'm a my research area is um, self-directed learning, prim primarily unschooling, but but more so democratic free schooling. And that's part of what I'm doing here in Germany. I'm a visiting professor at the University of Greifswald, um, where I'm teaching classes to people who are regular teacher ed students, but talking to them about alternative forms of education. And I'm also doing field work a couple of days a week at a democratic free school here in um, way northern Germany up by the Baltic Sea. Wow, thank you, uh, Kristen. That sounds really, really interesting. Um, who would like to go next? I, I can go next. Um, my name's not Richard, it's Diane. So I'm the wife of Richard who um, works at East Kent Sudbury in the UK. And it's a democratic self-directed homeschool support three days a week. And I am mum to our 11 year old son who attends that setting. And Richard is on another Zoom at the moment and then is hopefully gonna jump in when he can. So I, I'm logging on and being here in his place until he can be here. Okay, great, Diane, thank you. I can go next. Um, I'm Catherine and I'm in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I am a mom to two grown kids who um, I homeschooled for 
a while when they were younger until they were about nine and 12 um, and used mostly an unschooling um, method, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, but also I'm a teacher and, you know, sort of my work with my own kids interested me a lot in education. So I went for my master's in education, early childhood as well. Um, and I have worked in a whole bunch of different settings. So I've worked with Montessori, I've worked with Waldorf, I've worked with traditional, I've worked with progressive, I've worked in Reggio. So, um, yeah, I just kind of bring a lot to it. Um, but my love is self-directed education for sure. And I'm hoping to kind of, my path goes more in that direction, um, in the future. So I'm here. Thank you, Catherine. Anyone else? You don't feel like you have to do the introduction. You don't have to do the introduction, but if you want to go for it. Christy? Yes, I would go. Um, I'm a mom of four and a grandmother of four. And I was a preschool teacher for years and years. And now I'm fortunate enough to be unschooling with two of my grandkids. They are uh, nine and seven. And I'm also totally into it because I've been a play advocate and how children learn through play. And it's a huge passion of mine. It's so awesome to find the self-directed learning community um, because so much of what goes on in education comes from above and it's not children's choice. And it's, it's amazing. I always feel I just, what you said, Fran, earlier about learning from others I was passionate about teaching and not, it's not teaching. I like the guide term also. I was not comfortable with teaching, but learning from others and learning from children. And if we're always coming down and telling them what to do and what to think, we can't learn from them. And that's, there's so much wisdom there. So that's where yeah. I'm coming from. And I look forward to this whole weekend of seminar. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, who would like to go next? I'll go. Hi, everyone. I'm May. I'm a mom of two. Um, they are three and five, so quite little. I'm about to go into first official year of home slash unschooling with my eldest, but I'm a recovering a public school teacher. I was a reading specialist and teacher, elementary teacher for almost 10 years pre-COVID. And um, during COVID, I stayed home with my youngest, who was a baby, and really dove into uh, Rye um, and Montessori methods and um, have been researching self-directed education and alternative education for about a year and a half. And so this is my first conference uh, with um, ASD, and I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you, May. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> What's Hi, I'm, I'm Victoria. I'm in um, North Carolina in the United States. Um, I was a public school teacher for five years and then I uh, moved to North Carolina and I'm working with my sister-in-law with a, um, we, she started a homeschool learning collaborative space and, um, so I've been working with her and she's been my primary source of um, self-directed learning and, and what that means and um, Montessori education as well. So this is my first kind of dive into getting some um, more resources. Great, thank, thank you, Victoria. Thanks a lot. Um, for those who came in late, we're just doing uh, just quick like who you are, why you're here, intros, optional, optional. Uh, sorry, Sari, yes, you have your hand raised. Would sorry, you China. Yeah, hey, Fran, hi, familiar and new faces. Um, my name is Sari, um, I'm an unschooling mama to an eight-year-old um, vibrant spirit, and also a director and facilitator and agile learning center here in Mexico, and, uh, the coast of Oaxaca, Mexico, and also um, 
run an organization called Radical Learning, we support uh, fellow unschoolers, deschoolers, uh, parents, uh, adults supporting youth to deschool <laughs> and to kind of shed a lot of these uh, inherited and uh, the focus to support youth liberation and support our young people. Oh, it's super windy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ari. It sounds a little like, are you outside? Yeah, I'm kind of like outside. I'm going to try to find a better place. Okay. It's, we can hear you, but not amazingly. Okay. Yeah, I'm just here in solidarity and to um, connect community and Okay, thank you, Siri. Um, so a couple of people have introduced themselves in the comments. So take a look. And I can go, sorry, I can't really hear anyone, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm Aisha um, on um, Seminole, Yaiga and Calusa lands on, in um, South Florida. I have two girls, nine and six, who've never been to school. And we are right now in one of our co-ops. Um, so I may be in and out. I don't even know if you can hear me properly. I can hear nothing unless the phone is, you know, pressed against my ear. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty terrible, but I'm here for Fran because I think she's great. Um, and also I am, um, I'm presenting on Sunday on World Schooling. Um, so yeah, cause that's, that's how we transitioned from um, preschool to unschooling was through travel. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, Aisha, thanks for being here. Um, would anyone else like to go? I can go. I'll go. Um, oh, sorry. Th did you want to go first? I would like to go first. I got to get driving if you don't go mind. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> uh, my name is Carice. <clears throat> I run a cooperative um, preschool, homeschool, whatever somebody wants to call it. It's just a few families in a small cob house in the back of somebody's backyard. Uh, I'm really intrigued by this concept of invisible learning. I'm interested to know what, what that looks like. I think I, uh, this is my first year implementing um, self-directed education and unschooling um, ideologies and methods into my space. Um, I mean, I'm only like two years in and right when I started running the school is when I got introduced to self-directed education. And so... <clears throat> Yeah, I think I carry a lot of doubt around the fact that the kids are learning. They're between the ages three and five, and they do a lot of play on their own um, without, without me telling them to do anything. Um, and the more I try to direct them to do a project, whatever that looks like, the more resistance I, I get from them. Um, yeah, and I think I just have a lot of doubt. Not, I don't know if doubt's the right word, but um, I don't know if doubt's the right word, but I, there's a lot of confusion or like uh, guilt. I think guilt is a good word when, when they're playing for hours and I haven't really done much with them and I'm just kind of observing them. And then the parents are like, what'd you do today? And I'm like, we didn't, they, they did a lot, but I didn't do shit with them. <laughs> and so Anyway, um, yeah, I'm really curious about this topic. So thank you. But yeah, uh, Carice, I'm on Washu Paiute land in Nevada. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Carice. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's something that like a lot of us can probably relate to when we, we know, our, like we know intellectually that our kids are learning, but there's nothing we can really point to um there's nothing that is being produced necessarily and so it can yeah. feel really uncomfortable yeah um, yeah sylvie did you want to go next sure um i'm sylvie i am originally from france but now live in michigan and raised three unschoolers aged um 10 11 and 14 at the moment uh they've never been to school <clears throat> um and they've been doing sd all along so this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I especially love discussing how sometimes the learning is even invisible to the learner themselves, not just to us. Mm. <laughs> uh, and so I look forward to hearing what uh, 
everybody has to share on that topic. Thank you all. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, who would like to go? And I've kind of lost track a little bit, so I don't know if there's anybody left. I'm left, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Tessa. I'm in um, California, Napa Valley area. Um, I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, and we are definitely inspired to do self-directed education, unschooling type of thing in same 2020 after the disruptions there. And um, enrolled my daughter in kindergarten and then just realized this this wasn't really the, when I found this community, I was like, oh, this the schooling maybe is starting not to make sense, but this is starting to make more sense for me and my family. Um, and we, we took the, um, conference last year and really got so much out of it and I'm also just so lucky um, that I have my my mom Christy is has been helping with my kids and like doing this whole journey and other than feel so fortunate to have my mom like kind of helping us and other than that I, I feel like I don't have a lot of like community in our in our area so it feels a little isolating as I'm sure other people might feel that way too um, and I also see, like Carice said, a lot of just like amazing imaginary play and then sometimes feeling like, <laughs> so did I do the right thing today? Was I supposed to do something? Because they're super busy and they're having so much fun and they're totally active and engaged in doing things. But I didn't guide any project. <laughs> um, and it feels like the right thing, but um, it's good to talk to other people who also have those same feelings. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Tessa, for sharing. Um, Hi. Oh, I haven't gone yet. Sorry. Um, oh. I'm Jamie. Um, I'm in St. Louis on Osage land. I work with uh, a self-directed learning community called the Children's Community, um, just outside of St. Louis. Um, but what brought me to this session is I was a Montessori kid, um, and I came into this SDE space and just had kind of been further deconstructing like what education can be. Um, I also work another job where I come into contact with lots of different education philosophies. And so having more language to be able to communicate the value in free play um, and to better describe the work that we do at the children's community is really feeling important to me. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Um... I think Rivka, would you like to introduce yourself? You don't have to, it's completely optional. Um, I only oops. I only heard the last couple. So what are we doing? Just oh, so I why thought we're here. I actually thought there were a lot less people earlier. So I was like, this will be a really good idea. Everybody can introduce themselves. And and it is a good idea. Um, so <laughs> it's still a good idea. So uh, please go ahead. You can just say who you are, why you're here. Okay. Um, sure. I'm a single mom of a 12 year old girl and we've been unschooling since um, the pandemic started, since she was kind of trying to finish up third grade online. And so it's been three years now. And so I'm still learning and I'm here because I'm still de-schooling and I'm still working through, well, what if she's doing that for six hours? You know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of us are um, right there with you. Um, all right, has everybody either done an intro in the comments or uh, live? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna do my my presentation and there'll be moments when I'll kind of stop and we can, we can discuss a little bit. Uh, so it'll be like, interactive and hopefully it won't be just like me talking at you the whole time. All right, I think I was successful. Okay, so I'm going to talk about invisible learning, but I'm really going to talk more broadly about uh, just completely reimagining what we what learning is and how it happens. So I've already, I've already introduced myself, but I'll just very briefly say for the people who came in late, uh, I'm Fran, I have two kids. Um, 
uh, one is 11, my daughter's 11, my son is almost la- nine. Uh, we've been unschooling uh, sort of on and off, but uh, consistently for the last three years. Um, we are currently living in Bangkok in Thailand. Um, and we we move around a lot. Um, so that's just, um, yeah, part, part of our life. Um, and that's it. Okay. All right. Sorry, I just have to try and move the little box with the faces on it because otherwise I can't see my ooh, what have I done? Okay. All right. So uh why am I talking about <laughs> invisible learning? Um, so I first got thinking about it um when I was uh learning about um Reggio Emilia, uh, which is, and I think a few of you have said you are trained in Reggio or you worked in Reggio uh, schools and settings. Uh, it's it's a wonderful uh, early years um, method. Um, but I did notice that like, as I was learning about it, I, I basically love everything about it. It's all about children and uh, co-constructing uh, the, their own learning with the support of adults and peers. Um, but there was uh they there is this kind of um i don't want to say fixation but uh emphasis on making learning visible so it's talked about a lot in rego it's very much um and i'm not an expert on rego so please feel free to jump in if you are and correct me um but uh there is a lot of creating and a lot of learning and a lot of uh collaboration in the classroom but it did feel a lot like the learning was being channeled into something visible and concrete. And it kind of got me thinking about why, what is this need that we have um, to like make learning like tangible, right? Um, this seems, I mean, it, it, it's kind of everywhere, but uh, it, it really got me thinking about like, what are we doing here? Like, is this really necessary? Uh, and it got me reflecting on all the ways that uh, that we do learn all the time that are not being, um, that are not visible, uh, that are not kind of apparent, um, that are not able to be evaluated, they're not tangible, uh, they're not really useful. Uh, they don't necessarily serve an immediate purpose. Um, and also all the ways we learn that are not linear. Uh, so where there's no real visible linear progression necessarily, where we're like jumping around from one thing to the other. Um, and uh, just general learning that doesn't look like what we usually associate with learning. Um, and so, and then, you know, I, I kind of explored this concept a little bit and I, I began to also connect invisible learning with invisible labor, which um, you may have heard about, um, but it's, it's a, uh, invisible labor is essentially the labor that is, has been traditionally associated with women, but is not uniquely associated with women anymore. But anyway, it's all the, the kind of free labor that people do. So, for example, the caring of children and the caring, you know, looking after the house, uh, caring of like uh, elderly or disabled family members, all this sort of work, this kind of uh, labor that is perfectly legitimate labor, but that gets completely ignored because it doesn't have like a monetary value in society. Um, so, all right, let me figure out what, I, oh, okay. Okay, so I think a good place to start is like uh, trying to pinpoint what visible learning is. Um, and I would say that it's learning that conforms to the dominant paradigm of what children learning should look like. Um, and I wonder if like any of you can think of like an example of what kind of, what learning should look like. So when you see some, when you see it happening, you're like, oh yeah, that's learning. Um, feel free to just jump in. I, I can't see all of you because I'm Zoom incompetent. And so 
Just hi, this is Rivka. Hi. I think that the um, the quintessential what does learning look like is good report cards and you know getting great scores on tests. That's mm -hmm. like the ultimate proof that you've learned something, which mm -hmm. is of course a big fallacy because the vast majority of people just cram, pass the test, and forget everything the next morning. Yeah, yeah. But there's the idea, yeah, for sure, of like you have proof. There's a grade. There's a test result. That's proof that you've learned the thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dan also here. Experience. Yeah. Go ahead. This is Carice. Uh, just experiencing children coming back to me, remembering things from books, like not necessarily on report cards or whatever, but like the tangible experience of seeing that a child has learned something, be it because they remembered or because they were really fascinated by it and yeah, share that information with their parents or with their sister back with me later in a week or in a month. Mm. Yeah, so that's the kind of learning where you're like, okay, like you know it's it's been learned because they remember it a long while ago. It's kind of comforting, right? That's that's the kind of learning that feels comforting to us because we're like, okay. It's tangible, right? Like you feel accomplished. You're like, oh yeah, you you took that in. Good job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking in general, kind of curriculum, like worksheet type stuff, um, where you see it's it's tech, like it's definitely visible. You can hold it, and the parent often is the one that can say like, "Hey, we've covered and learned this area of knowledge." Mm -hmm. It's all subdivided. It's like you can see it there. You're like moving from one thing to the next, right? But that is definitely, it's, it's kind of what we traditionally associate to, to learning, right? It happens like that. In a I also sequence. just wanted to add um, when kids do what I instruct them to do, like when I see that I've given an instruction or you know, some activity or something. And then I see them do it according to how I think it should be done. And that actually comes up a lot, like in Reggio with the provocations that um, kids will do all kinds of stuff with what you give them. And then, but what I'm looking for as a teacher is like, are they going to find their way to that thing that I need to check off? Right. Yeah. So it's that like you have an outcome kind of or, or a desired outcome in a way so it's it's almost like the kids have an illusion of of self-direction but really you want it to lead somewhere right mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting um okay um so I have some ideas about uh, just further ideas about what um, learning looks like in the kind of our dominant uh, educational model. Um, and so it's some of the things that you all touched upon. It's it's apparent, it's visible, um, it's you can literally touch it. Um, it's learning that can be assessed. It can either be tested or you can ask questions and you know, you get the desired answer. Um, again, it's, that's kind of an illusion. Like we, you know, when we, when we're testing and we get the, the kid gets the right answer, it doesn't necessarily mean they've actually learned the thing, but I think that we've decided that that's what it means, right? So um, learning that is, we, that we believe is measurable, uh, like in a test or an exam or a project. Um, and, uh, and also there's just this preference for like learning that lends itself to be evaluated. Cause we like that. We like to see learning that we can evaluate, that we can be like, oh yeah, they've understood that. Well, that's good. Or, um, Sylvie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I find this really interesting. Maybe it's because we've never actually done any curriculum in my home or yeah. Um, any school-like uh, setting. So this is really not the first thought that came to me. To me, it's more about like visible learning. It's more about the kids being able to do things for themselves, like 
lacing their shoes or cooking or uh, solving a problem that they have. Like this is what I see as learning in my home. I had like no thoughts about grades or curriculum or anything like that. So I find I just wanted to comment on that. This is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of us who start unschooling from the beginning probably don't overthink the more schoolish type of learning um, because we don't need to. But uh, I think it's helpful to know what it is that we're pushing back on. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, anyway, so um, the, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so and learning that is like kind of data driven. So we see this a lot in schools. Like I think a lot of homeschoolers don't really do this, although some do. Um, um, we also have this idea that like, teaching equals learning and so that whatever is taught will be learned exactly in the same way that it is taught when of course we know that like there's a huge disconnect often between teaching and learning like teaching does not equal learning um so often the way that like learn you know the dominant idea of education and learning looks like is is top down uh, so coming from an adult or from a more knowledgeable person to a less knowledgeable person. Um, and there's also this idea that like um, it has to be structured. It, sorry, it has to be linear. Um, so everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. Um, but even if it's just your one child, um, often we have this idea that like they have to progress in a certain way and that there has to be an upward progress. So it's kind of like uh, we have this idea that it's it's almost inevitable that your child will learn a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. But actually, even this idea of progress is a social construct. It doesn't happen like that. Like sometimes it does. Sometimes people learn like that. But obviously, but but sometimes they just don't. Like we've just created this kind of idea of um yeah, of like progression and development. Um, so yeah, so um, tangible learning and visible learning is, is essentially proof. Proof, or we think it's proof of the learning that's happened. It's, it's actually probably not. Um, Josiah. Yeah, we have some, a question in chat. Jamie asks oh. if you would be comfortable with people taking screenshots of slides yeah 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 absolutely in fact i can I, i'd be happy to share the slides yeah with who wants to at the end because we have a few people that actually do want the slides for later so yeah that's great if you put your email in the in the chat at the end of the session yeah i'll take all the emails down and then i can i'd be happy to email them you can direct message the emails to fran by the way guys you don't have okay. to put it directly in the direct chat. You oh, direct right. message. Yes, exactly. Yes, if you don't want to share your email with everybody. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're under the, the illusion that we, we can, in fact, measure learning and we can draw conclusions about learning and then apply them just universally to all children in the world. But that is, again, just a construct and it's absolutely not the case. Um, and then there's also this, uh, the way we see learning is also affected a lot by the adult gaze. So by the way that like adults see children. Um, and um, that's a huge bias that we have, and that is quite hard to step away from. Um, and I mean, I could go on and on talking about the adult gaze, um, but I won't because this presentation isn't about that but it's a really interesting um, thing to explore. Um, and Carol Black actually talks about the evaluative gaze of school in one of her essays. So if you haven't read her essays, um, I would definitely go and read that one. It's brilliant. Um, I mean, I'll go through this quickly, but I mean, we know, we I think we mostly know why this dominant, dominant educational model exists. It's just easier or, school the school system believes that it's easier 
to make learning visible so that it can be assessed um, and so that they can stick to their outcomes and they can kind of move students from one spot to the other in a linear progression. And also they just need, they need proof because fundamentally uh, the school system lacks trust in both the people teaching uh, and the educators and in the children. And also there's this growing obsession, and this depends on where you live, um, but in many European countries, this is the case. Um, in many countries all over the world, there's this growing obsession with accountability. So everyone's accountable to the, the person above them in the hierarchy. The, the students are accountable to the teachers and the teachers are accountable to the administration of the school and the administration of the school is accountable to the region and the region, national, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's what kind of also um, keeps this, um, channels this obsession with making learning visible. It like, there's a kind of purpose to it that is bigger than just like the adult child relationship. Um, and also capitalism. <laughs> Um, you know, like labor, uh, learning has, it, it isn't really given a value if it can't be measured, if it can't be evaluated, if it can't be counted. Um, and there's also this kind of capitalistic obsession with busyness and, uh, being productive. Uh, and so learning and labor have to be seen to have some sort of monetary value or value of some kind. Um, in order for it to be worth worth anything. Um, so I always go back to like our conception of children and childhood. Like, I think that's kind of like the foundation of kind of everything and all the ways that we, we treat children and young people. And it influences the way we think of education and that in turn influences the way we think about learning. So it's kind of like a... a a chain and the root for me is the way we see children. Uh, and I wanted to share this car uh, cartoon with you. I don't know if you know this uh, cartoonist. He is, his name is actually, he's Italian. His name is Francesco Tonucci, uh, but he goes by Frato. That's like his, uh, you know, name as a cartoonist. So I'm sure there's a word for that. Um, but I love it because it's the child going in to a setting of some sort and they have all these ideas about what they're going to be doing, which mostly involve play. Um, you know, there's all the, the car and the boat and the, the sun and sandcastles or whatever. And then the guide or the teacher is has a whole other bunch of ideas about what learning is going to be and it's going to involve numbers and shapes and letters and like all this very tangible stuff. Um, and I think it illustrates really well, like the disconnect uh, between children and what they need and want and the adults in charge. Um, okay, so just going back to like the way we conceive children, I feel like this is like the foundation of kind of everything. And uh, we have um, our conception of, of children has mostly been a kind of white European conception and it's been influenced and uh, spread by the dominant culture in global minority countries. So this, this conception of children has then kind of been spread all over the place and imposed. Um, and we see children as adults in the making and like not whole people, uh, empty cups that need to be filled, uh, blank slates, uh, you know, not worthy of the same rights as adults. Uh, we also see them as like innocent, uh, which seems like it's not an issue or a problem, but in some ways it is because uh, when someone is seen as, as innocent and they're also seen as incapable, they're seen as in need of shielding and protecting. And there's that kind of like, I'm gonna help you, but also control you vibe. Um, and then they are also seen as, uh, as 
kind of answering to a very specific idea of child development and the way that children should develop. And this has been propped up by scientific research. I'm not saying that all of this research is wrong or, um, you know, unhelpful, but I think the over-reliance on it and the imposition of it on all cultures and all children all over the world is, again, a social construct. And we've just kind of like, now we take it as truth, just truth, universal truth. Um, so anyway, as a result of seeing children like that, we end up seeing education and learning in certain ways as well. So we see to, uh, we see education as a way to shape children into like future workers or future citizens. And we see it as the filling of a cup. Um, again, we see it as this kind of linear uh, progression uh, where you're like just piling knowledge. You know, you're kind of climbing a mountain as opposed to like, um, the spreading of branches, which would be really different, a different way of seeing it, right? And um, we also see it as, you know, rooted in, in, in adult-led, and even if it's not a curriculum, in, in adult-led expectations. So even things like that we expect our children to be doing at, at any given age, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, when we see education like that, we also um, seeing learning as as proof that education is happening. And we see it as something that we need to evaluate and assess. And also as proof that children are becoming who we want them to be. Um, and also in a school setting, but I mean, sometimes not even in a school setting, like learning is then used as a way to rank people. Um, because there's people who are ahead and people who are behind and someone's doing better and someone do, someone's doing worse. And there's this kind of like enforced competition almost um, that becomes inherent in learning when learning is not a competition. Um, anyway, so I, you may be asking yourself, why does invisible learning matter? Uh, why can't we just like get rid of this whole, uh, you know, dominant paradigm, all the de-schooling that we are all doing uh, and have been doing is serves to do that, right? To step out of this paradigm and just kind of live our life. Like, why do we have to be bothered with like even talking about learning? Um, I think um, that that it's important for various reasons that I'm going to go into but I'd love to hear your thoughts so far and I don't want to be like talking too much uh so I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts on what I've said so far or um any thoughts on this idea of like stepping outside and just kind of living our lives I'm going to jump in this is Kristen Morrison I am just just still grappling with your idea of connecting this invisible learning with invisible labor in the home. It's my mind has gone pew pew. <laughs> that's a great uh, connection that I had never thought of. So that's just that's just one reaction that I have. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it it is kind of. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later on, but yeah. Fran, can you clarify what you're asking us exactly to respond to? Are you just wanting general comments now or specifically oh, about this? You can make a general comment or you can just reflect on this idea of like, why aren't we just stepping outside of even thinking about learning and like living our life uh, and not thinking about learning at all? Um, or you can just, any any other comment you want to make. Brian, I have uh, two comments to make. Uh, I love how you kind of set everything up. So thank you for the work that you've done. Um, I think you were talking about adult gaze and that you didn't want to go off in that direction, but I think it's so linked and such an overlap in this. And the adult gaze is what makes the performance, like the assessment necessary for children, right? That's the reason that they have to perform for adults 
And, you know, here four years into unschooling, I, I'm realizing more and more that that it's that it's the adult gaze that is saying like you have to show me what you're learning and i'm getting more and more comfortable with not asking my child to perform for me um mm. and so i think that yeah i think that's a big concept and another thing that i was really thinking is that you know carol black is so great and i love that you brought her up another um really influential influential person in this way of thinking for me has been Frank Smith with his book, um, what is it? The Book of Learning and Forgetting. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys haven't read that, I highly, highly recommend it. And I'm just gonna give you one quote to leave you with. Um, While learning is normally inconspicuous, failure to learn can't be concealed. You don't need a test to discover whether individuals are learning, just look at their faces. And that was from his book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I love that. I love that. And yeah, it's so true. And I've not, I haven't read that book. So uh, thanks for the, the recommendation. Um, and yeah, I agree. The adult gaze is, is a huge part of this. And, and, I, and I didn't want to go off on a whole tangent. But, but it is true that, uh, especially as, well, I mean, it's the adult gaze is everywhere. Uh, everywhere that there are adults, which is everywhere. Um, but I think just from a home perspective, uh, you know, being at home with our children, like we, I'm so aware of how I'm constantly watching them and um, what effect that might have on them. Uh, and I think that's something that we all need to like really pause and think about. Um, and I, you know, some of us will have been affected by it more than others, um, depending on who we are and our background and just our circumstances and I guess the way we are as well. Um, but I remember feeling it very strongly as a child, like feeling watched, this, this idea of feeling watched and also feeling like there were these expectations in the watching, right? So um I think it's it's a huge part of de-schooling for me is to not carry that on and not like perpetuate it you know on my children um I don't know if anyone else wants to share anything about that I just wanted to comment on that I I think that a lot of that if not all of that comes from our sense of responsibility and our lack of trust so mm. I think I think it's about defining who is responsible for the child's learning. And I think that's sort of the hidden elephant in the room where adults feel like we, we are responsible for what they learn. Yeah. Um, and that's what guides almost everything in my opinion. Um, and then, and then not trusting them to do it for themselves, like not trusting that kids will come out okay that they will that they have the will and the the curiosity and the capability of determining their own path and that that will lead to somewhere where they'll be able to survive you know we I think we just don't trust that our kids will survive <laughs> if we let them choose for themselves so I think it does come down to responsibility and trust yeah, yeah, thanks for saying that. I think that, yeah, the idea of like who is responsible is is huge. Um, and often we we, I mean, I've certainly wondered, like, is it me? Like, am I responsible? And how much am I responsible? And if they are responsible, then what's what's our role, right? Um I mean, I think the way I see it now is, is I see it a bit like, uh, and I've like what I've always done with my children in terms of food, like I'm responsible when they were smaller, I was responsible for doing the shopping and, you know, uh, making the meals and putting them out there. And then they are responsible for eating. So if they eat nothing, I can't make them eat. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, has always been my, what I've done with food. 
Uh, and, you know, as they get, get older, like we can talk about like, what what is it that you like to eat? We can go shopping together. We can like make meals together. They can make meals sometimes uh, for themselves. Uh, so it changes, right, as kids grow. But I still am not making the meat. Uh, and I'll never force them to eat and I'll never guilt trip them into eating. Um, so I don't know. That's kind of that's been helpful for me to see learning in the same way. I don't know if that makes sense. Can I make a comment? Mm. Yeah, please. I um, I have I'm having a thought process right now. Um, a memory. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as how it, it plays into this responsibility piece and learning. Mm -hmm. I, um, we had a young girl in our family. She was fostered. My aunt fostered her. And in her environment prior to us fostering her, it was not a good environment, not one that was like nurtured. And I think that that like I don't know why this is coming up for me. Like it feels like there needs to this there needs to be a piece of this conversation that like we as adults are responsible for the children. We're not necessarily like we don't need to dominate over them. And we do I do agree that we there needs to be a much larger level of trust than what is currently there. Mm. And I watched that child go from an environment where like she was able to do wherever she, whatever she wanted, whenever she wanted. There was not a lot of like nurturing in the learning and like in the learning piece. Going from one home that did that to another home that was super nurturing in that way. And I watched her like her personality change, her just the growth in general and so I don't know why this is coming to mind but um it's really prevalent in my brain right now mm. um no thank you for sharing that uh Carice. um I think um I mean you know it all all children are different obviously and uh, I don't think there's a one way to do it. And I'm never gonna be like, this is the one way. Um, and and I have, you know, I only have two children and they are completely different. Uh, and I do different things with the two of them. So yeah, I mean, I think what I said about the the meals and the, the food is is kind of a broad generalization and obviously it's not gonna work for everybody. Um, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, I have so many thoughts, so I'll just try to pick one. Kari, I just want to, um, I feel you so much, especially from when you first shared about running your learning or like co-facilitating your, your learning space. I think when we're supporting young people um, in more like, I don't know, official learning environments, I definitely relate to the feeling of like being responsible for these young people in their process. Um, and the, 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 not difficulty, but like the layers of that. And I think um, for me, what it comes down to is that principles that I find dear to my heart that have helped me in this process have been like learning happens all the time. Like we are always learning and the need to quantify and measure that learning is a construct that has come from Western colonialism, particularly. There are indigenous cultures that do not view kids and do not view learning and do not view relationships with kids in, in these ways. And I think um, there's a lot to, to learn from these cultures. Um, and so I think um, for, for me, what, is, what I always come back to in my own practice is the relationship with, with the learners and that learning happens through relationship with them. And so, yeah, there are things that society tells us like we need to learn, but we all learn in different ways. And so um, 
like in, in the learning space that I'm in, I'm always like, I don't want to focus on what young people are doing or what they're learning in the space. I want to focus on who are these people and who am I and how can we relate to each other on like a humanistic level. And it's really hard when you have parents that are always like asking you, what did my kid do today? And what did my kid learn today? And I find that to be such a struggle. And so then the work kind of expands to how do we support families and parents to also like deconstruct their way of learning and yes find that balance like what you were saying Chris like find that balance of like what is my responsibility and where is the boundary for when I'm like encroaching on this other human space and process so I really appreciate you bringing that up um thank you because it's it's a struggle and um I just I hear you yeah um thank you Suri and Carice for because I, I appreciate your perspective from being facilitators in a center because I think that's it's it's a different you know people are bringing their children to you and entrusting you to do something and to be responsible for them essentially and that's a very different I think responsibility to uh living life with your own children right uh and I don't have that experience so I really appreciate you uh jumping in with that uh and yeah and I think it's more complex for sure when it's not your own children and when like you say sorry people are coming and saying you know what are they learning um and you're kind of like that's not what we're doing like we're just trying to like live and get to know each other and you know get to know ourselves um so yeah um okay I'm just I'm just gonna I can I can jump in real quick too. Just, um, I am also a facilitator. So just kind of to also like inspire maybe in we're right now at our, um, center, we have like a movie we're writing and filming and it's just so amazing to kind of see the kids come in and they're just like ready to get to it. Like, they're like, okay, are we filming today? What are we doing? Like they're setting up the green screen. They're picking out a title slide. They're, you know, doing graphic design. Like they're doing so much stuff and they're just really super passionate about it. And they're learning so much. So, and, you know, I'm working in partnership with them. So you are like, the, that um what you said about like relationship building and like how different kids learn like you have to think of really like the whole person and you know self-directed learning and unschooling really provides a great um space to work like with those kids or people one-on-one and get to you know know their learning styles yeah thank you thank you Ali um that's that's really valuable um yeah so I mean there is a case to be made for like let's not focus on learning let's focus on all that stuff that you and Suri and Chris were talking about uh you know who's responsible for what the the relational aspect and all of that so I'm 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 a big fan of all that I'm also a fan though of um figuring out why invisible learning like does actually matter. And I think it matters because it pushes back on a bunch of different narratives that I mentioned earlier on. So it pushes back on the way we see children. So once we recognize that learning happens and it's invisible and sometimes we can't put our finger on it, sometimes we don't know. And sometimes the learner doesn't even know that they're learning or what they're learning. We also see children as more fully human so we see them as whole people as capable uh resourceful and worthy of all the things autonomy agency respect and uh we also see them outside of this narrative of like you know progress and development um and just childhood as a period and time that is worthy worthy and worthwhile in its own right It's not a preparation for anything. Um, We can also then, as a result, push back on what what education looks like. Um, So when we see children differently, um, education becomes an entirely different thing. It becomes relationships, like like some of you said. It becomes um, getting to know yourself and getting to know others and building that awareness. Uh, It becomes an opportunity uh, open-ended, 
uh, not uniform, but like just different for every single child and family and uh, community. And um, it becomes, it, 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 really education could just be whatever that unique individual believes education should be, which would be an amazing thing if if every child could kind of conceive of education that way. Um, I was going to have a whole conversation about education, but I, I'm going to I'm going to plow through a little bit uh, so that we can talk a little bit at the end. Um, anyway, so when we see education in all of those ways uh, as more expansive, then we can also see learning as like way more expansive uh, than we uh, told it should be. Um, so we can see it as living life uh, and not really focusing on whether you're learning or not. Um, on finding community, on finding people and places where you belong, uh, on building self-awareness, play, totally legitimate learning, uh, exploring, reading, playing video games, doing nothing. Like any time a child is just lying around, apparently doing nothing, that might also be learning. We might not be seeing it, the child might not even know that it's happening, but it might be happening. Um, daydreaming, my I have one child who loves to daydream. And I was super resistant to it initially because I was like worried, um, you know, at the beginning and thinking like, oh my goodness, like she's spending all this time like playing music and walking around her room and daydreaming and when I asked her what what she was doing she's like oh I'm daydreaming and then I thought well that's it it's not seen as learning but it's totally learning um and sure I could break it down in all the elements of learning but I choose not to because she's just doing what she needs and she's living her life and there is learning there and I don't necessarily always have to pinpoint it um telling stories, having conversations. I think a lot of unschoolers can relate with uh, how much learning happens in just chatting and having conversations with our children. Uh, and then, you know, once we acknowledge that learning happens in all of these ways, we see learning in completely different ways. So we see it as completely abstract, um, as something that doesn't leave a trace, uh, that cannot be assessed. Uh, you cannot come up with a bunch of data to show that that learning happened, uh, it's often incomplete. Like it's just scattered. Um, there's no kind of linear progression. Uh, it's, it isn't uniform. Uh, and sometimes it's impossible to know what it is, whether it's happening, the person learning doesn't even know that it's happening. Um, and it's sometimes it's private. Um, you know, we don't always have to know what our child is learning. Perhaps they are learning and they are aware of it, but it's like their thing. Uh, you know, it's their learning. It's not our learning. Um, and it's also seeing learning as very culturally specific. I feel like that is so important. And I think that touches upon what Suri was saying of how this, this kind of dominant idea of learning is not the way that a lot of indigenous um, uh, communities and cultures have seen learning and have seen children and have viewed education. Uh, and we have somehow imposed it or tried to impose it on everybody else that actually this is not, this is not the only way that children have been treated and that education has been seen. So that's really important. Um, and also point like learning that has no apparent purpose, that is kind of pointless, that cannot be quantified. Um, and then I'm going to kind of try and skim through this a little bit because we're running um, out of time and I want to have time to discuss. But uh, this is kind of the important, this is like the important bit for me, which is um, the reasons why we why talking about invisible learning matters. 
uh, and it matters because it pushes back on a bunch of stuff. Um, for example, uh, when we point out to our children that learning is happening just from living and that like living is learning, this is mass a massively radical statement. Um, and it's massively called uh, countercultural. Um, because I mean, I'm sure you've all been asked, like, how will they learn if you don't make them? Um, so even just saying to our children, you're learning all the time um, is huge. Uh, and then it also means that there'll be no hierarchy of activities. So there'll be no activities that are like the fun activities and no activities that are work, uh, you know, and there'll be no activities that are like more educational and like kind of useless uh, activities. Um, and these narratives are like so prevalent just out in society. You don't even have to go to school to like be exposed to them. So I think it's it's massively valuable to like talk about learning in these ways. Um, and then we can start kind of assigning uh, value or ranking activities. And we step out of that capitalist mindset that wants to rank everybody and rank what they're doing by a level of importance and value. Uh, and we can also just do things because uh, we feel like it. And we can allow our children to just do things because they get joy out of them or for literally no reason. Um, and when we embrace kind of this idea of an um, uh, invisible labor, uh, sorry, we don't, we're not embracing, we're not embracing invisible labor. Uh, when we talk about invisible la labor, it's, you know, like I said, historically been associated with kind of domestic work, essentially, and child caring. Um, but what I've often thought about this is that it's actually not, I mean, we call it invisible, but it's actually just ignored. It's actually not invisible. If anyone pays any attention, they'll see it. Uh, and I feel like the word invisible puts the onus on the actual labor. Whereas when we talk about invisible labor as ignored labor, then we're putting, we're shifting the responsibility for ignoring it on the people ignoring it, if that makes any sense. And so um, I like to call it ignored labor and perhaps invisible uh, learning should also be called ignored labor, uh, sorry, ignored learning, because it's not that it's not happening. It's not that we can't see it. Like if we pay attention, we can see it. Maybe we don't know exactly what it is because we're not obsessed with kind of quantifying it and pinpointing it, but we know it's happening. And so maybe it's just ignored and it's undervalued by society in the same or very similar ways that it invisible labor or ignored labor is also ignored and undervalued. Um, and so I feel quite strongly about this point of like taking the responsibility uh, from the labor itself and shifting it to the people ignoring it or the systems that ignore it. Uh, Josiah, you have your hand up. Uh, so Catherine asks, Mm -hmm. Useful or useless to to what is it in is an important question I think who slash what determines what is useful or useless? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Um, I think there's a lot. I think we. I mean, we've all heard people be like, "Oh, why are you doing that? It's useless." But yes, to your point, it useless for who? Um, and I think, yeah, pushing back on that idea that like, it's really not about what other people value and what other people think is useful. Um, it's about what you think is useful and, and useless. Um, and it's also okay to do useless stuff, you know? Um, all right, so talking about invisible learning is also kind of resisting this idea of like, productivity we're not machines and we aren't here to like constantly produce something that is measurable uh and we're worthy for just existing and so are our children um 
And lastly, and I've said this, but I'll just reiterate, it's also making space for the idea that we actually don't know and we actually cannot measure most learning. Like we, we think we can, and there's a lot of science of learning um, and some of it might be helpful, but in actual fact, uh, we can't really measure learning. And even when we can, we can't really extrapolate from this one group of children in this one setting to all the children in the world. And I think we tend to forget that. Um, and also there's this idea that maybe only our child really knows what they're learning. And maybe sometimes they don't even know, and that's okay. And again, back to the adult gaze, like, is it even our business to be watching and judging and putting our finger on what is being learned? Um, like, should that even be our role? Um, I have some questions that uh, we could discuss. Um, I'm open to whatever, if you guys have either questions or things to say about any of this, um, Ali. Um, just, I do like with that question, like, are we even, should we be like, you know, observing what our kids are learning? Um, for me, like, at least I think it's important to, um, like talk to kids definitely about the dangers of like getting sucked into, uh, like the all right pipeline or something, which I, you know, talk to, um, my child a lot about just being, especially online. Um, so I think not necessarily like observing, but discussing is super important. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I think conversations need to be had around many things. Uh, and that is our role. Like we're not, we're not bystanders. We're not simply just standing there trying not to watch them um so I'm not you know definitely not um advocating for that but I think the way that we watch them sometimes like we could have we could be introspective about that and kind of reflect on it and also like you know I'm always um and I don't have any answers about you know about this but I'm always kind of grappling with like how much is too much uh, interference or, you know, should I be interfering more? Interfering maybe is not the right word. Um, Aisha, I see your hand up. Sorry, on my phone and I had to find that button. So I'm making, there's so much going through my mind right now, but um, I guess the first thing is one of the things that really keeps me grounded in this whole unschooling thing are the words of the Indian um, educator Satish Kumar, where he says, like dominant education right now is spending trillions of dollars training one half of one organ, and that's the brain. Whereas scientifically we can see that the entire body takes in information, the skin, the breathing apparatuses, everything takes in information, but we're obsessed with how this one part of the brain processes and communicates what it quote unquote learns. And I think also this, it releases me a little bit from this idea of responsibility. Sure, I have responsibility, but also there's not really scientifically even a way for me to know everything that someone who isn't me learns, right? Like sometimes I can see it in my kids' perspectives towards things, the way they approach something, um, there are lots of nonverbal um, ways that I can see what they learn, but also sometimes it's just not possible for me to see because the entire body learns. And when I think about that, it releases a lot of that anxiety, maybe not the responsibility, that's not what I mean, but it releases the anxiety around that responsibility because how much responsibility can I have when so much of that learning isn't accessible by language? That's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, and I'm going to keep that short, is um, someone touched on indigenous cultures. And I'm thinking um, when you say invisible learning about the Hawaiian writer um, Manulani Myers, and she writes about embodied learning um, mm -hmm. for Kanaka Maoli, the indigenous peoples of, of the kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and also the Anishinaabe writer Leanne Simpson, who calls it, I mean, it seems to me what you're talking about is invisible learning 
is what they call embodied learning in a lot of indigenous cultures. Um, and she talks about how there's one point in like the 70s or something where you could find in Canadian universities, elders teaching, you know, things from their culture in universities. And now, unless that comes with a master or a PhD, there are no longer elders teaching in university spaces. And this is, you know, such a loss, obviously, culturally for all of us, but also it's an example of ignored learning, right? As you said, like ignored labor um, instead of invisible labor, because it's not like people don't see it. It's not like people don't know that all of that, you know, knowledge exists. It's that it's ignored and it isn't um, given value. So, yeah, I'll end it there. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, really important. And I did, I've ne I'd never heard of embodied learning and I'm going to be looking that up. Thank you so much. Uh, Carice? Oh. We lose you. Oh no, there you are. Um, Carissa, do you want to say something? Are you able to hear me? Oh yes, now we do. Now I can. Yeah, I think when I think about invisible learning, hi, I have this at like, um, like to touch on what Aisha said, um, like modeling behavior. And so like a child who watches their mother garden every year and then picks up that bee, I don't want to say, but picks, picks that up and starts mimicking that behavior. Like that's what I think of as invisible learning. And when you think about these tribes or old indigenous cultures or indigenous cultures now, however you want to word that, and their children are running around and doing their thing, but they're observing the adults and what they're partaking in. They're partaking in the making of the masa. They're partaking in, in the tending to the land. And that, that, there's that seeing or them watching that, whether we're realizing they're watching it or not, is the invisible learning. Um, yeah, yeah. Partaking in... Yeah, just like if you're partaking in activities around your children that you want them to be learning, then they're going to learn exactly what they need to learn or they're, or, or they're not going to pick it up. It really, yeah, anyway. Yeah, no, you're absolutely uh, right. And I think that's kind of the cultural apprenticeship. I've seen this written somewhere side of uh, self-directed education all the stuff that our children pick up that is things that like we do on a daily basis um, that we don't even notice that we do but it's like uh, things that are to do with our culture and that our children are just kind of absorbing um, and I think that doesn't happen as much anymore in the way that our societies are structured unfortunately because we don't hang out with like a group of family members on a daily basis or within our community, like we're not as embedded in our community, but this is certainly happening in other places and in other cultures and uh, maybe in some indigenous cultures. I don't know, but maybe Aisha, you might have more, no I mean, you definitely have more knowledge than I do on this. Um, Oh, sorry. Sorry, I missed your hand. Hey, um, I just popped it up. I'm super grateful for this conversation. Um, and something that I'm thinking of is that I, I feel, so I'm going to share a, a goal that I had this year, um, directing and facilitating in an agile, we don't even call it a center anymore. It's more like a community. I had the, the desire to not be a like a facilitator anymore to not be called a facilitator or director um, because I felt like that label was like disconnecting me from young people in our space and also when parents would come into the space it was very much like they were the parents and we all had these roles and I wanted to shift more into a we are collectively learning here and I think that what I'm seeing, and I see this in myself, is like this desire to want to 
understand how young people are learning, what they're learning, even like what we need to do to support them to learn for me comes from like my disconnect to my own learning process and myself as a, as a learner in this world. And so I, I almost wish that we can step away from needing to even use these terms, like what are we learning? Like what are we, like, and more just like, what are we sharing with each other? Like, how are we each human evolving? And how, how can we share our growth? with others. And so it's just that I really appreciate this conversation because it's kind of like challenging me to think about some of the language that we're, we're, has evolved in this movement, but also like, am I so fixated on learning and whether we're, the kids are learning enough or not because I'm disconnected from my own learning? Like, it's a question that I'm leaving this conversation with. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um... I think that, yeah, I think maybe for me personally, I feel like the next step will, will be like stopping talking about learning. <laughs> but uh, now, like at this point, I do feel that it's helpful for all the various reasons uh, that I said. And because our whole society is so steeped in all of these ideas that, you know, if you don't, if you're not actively like pushing back on them and finding new words for it, then you kind of succumb to them a little bit. Well, that's how I feel. Um, but I but I see what you're saying. Like, I think there is so, so many places to go with this that are beyond, um, beyond even talking about learning. Um, we are... Time is kind of up, but I'd love to hear from anyone else who wants to just say something. I mentioned in the comments, but I'm feeling really inspired to change my language depending on what I'm actually trying to communicate. Uh... Fran, I had um, a thought, it's kind of more of a side note. Um, there was one thing that I was working through in my kind of early de-schooling when I started unschooling, and it was about repetitive play. Um, and repetitive play, it took me a while to, well, I learned the science kind of behind it, that children that aren't like, say, soothing themselves and are actually learning through repetitive play, that they will always be doing something slightly different, like slight iterations of the same thing. And to us parents, our adult gaze, it's annoying, right? <laughs> you know, that it can be. And, mm -hmm. and we want them to stop and we want them to like do something again, probably more useful. Uh, and it took me some time learning about this research as well as um, just like thinking about it that, that kids do things again and again, and it looks exactly the same and, and it can look like annoying to us adults, but they are like imperceptibly learning something new, trying out something new, whether it's in their head or, you know, in the play itself. Um, and I thought that was so cool to learn about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I, I've heard of a lot of kids doing things like that, like repetitive play or even like watching the same video like over and over and over again and you're like pretty sure you know everything that's like you know being said here but maybe not right I mean there's always something behind that and often it's something we can't we don't see thank you so much I could have kept going forever because I love to talk about these things but I really appreciate you all being here and I love the conversations we had and it's given me a lot to think about so uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.